Hello everybody, this is the What You Need to Know About Syphilis. These 10 minute videos are designed to help you review the hour lecture you recently watched so you can make sure you got the major points of each lecture. Now we'll be discussing the most important topics for each subject covered and sometimes that will require reviewing some details, but we will not be going into the level of detail that was covered in each lecture. I'll be asking questions as the video proceeds and I encourage you to pause the video and answer the questions on your own before I go over the answers. At the end of the video I will post a link to some good review questions, a short outline of the full lecture, and some suggested reading for those of you who are unsure about any of the major points covered in the video. Let's get started. So the main topics we're going to be covering about syphilis are the etiology, the transmission and epidemiology. We're going to spend a lot of time on this third point here, the pathophysiology and clinical manifestations, really trying to relate what's going on on a pathophysiological level with what sort of clinical manifestations we're seeing in the patient. Diagnosis, treatment, and then I'll throw up that link for questions and suggested readings. Here we go. The etiology of syphilis. Do you remember the bacteria that causes syphilis? Syphilis is caused by a bacteria called Treponema pallidum pallidum. Now, this guy is easy to recognize in pictures because he is shaped like a spiral. While the subspecies Treponema pallidum pallidum causes syphilis, other subspecies of Treponema pallidum cause the diseases yaws, endemic syphilis, and pinta. But these diseases are very rare in American medicine. They can, however, cause false positive serologies for syphilis in American immigrants, which we'll touch on later. Treponema has a very simple genome. He doesn't have a lot of genes for the Krebs cycle or oxidative phosphorylation or anything like that. Instead, he spends most of his energy making transporters to scavenge molecules from his surroundings. It's understandable, then, that he likes to hang out in areas where there's lots of nutrients available, like the blood. Now, this should reinforce some points about the pathogenesis of disease, which we'll review later. Along those same lines, tryponema have been very difficult to culture in vitro. In fact, the only medium that grows tryponema pallidum is a medium consisting of rabbit testicles. Poor bunnies. Do you remember the order that syphilis belongs to? Syphilis is in the order Spirocatalis. Now, I don't want to yourself crazy memorizing the phylogeny of every bacteria you learn. Oh, that would be a major waste of time. But the fact that syphilis is a spirochete is important because Spirocatalis contains three other genera of spiral bacteria that cause human disease. Do you remember the other three? Leptospira, which is a major cause of animal transmitted disease worldwide. Borrelia, which causes Lyme disease. And Brachyspira, which is a rare cause of intestinal infections. Syphilis is transmitted by penetrating the mucous membranes and the microabrasions in the skin during sexual contact. Once it has penetrated these barriers, it spreads via blood vessels and lymphatics, creating local and metastatic foci of infections. It is highly infectious. The 50% inoculation dose is just 57 organisms. Now, what does that mean, the 50% inoculation dose? Well, if I took 10 individuals and inoculated each one of them with 57 treponema organisms, five would become symptomatic with syphilis. That wouldn't be very nice of me. Despite the high infectivity of the organism, the prevalence and incidence of syphilis has decreased 95% from 1943 to now. Well, what happened in 1943? penicillin became widely available. So we'll touch on treatment later, but the early stages of syphilis remain exquisitely sensitive to penicillin treatment. It is notable that there was a small increase of cases of syphilis in the 1980s. Can you think of why? The HIV epidemic. Currently, most cases of syphilis in the U.S. affect men who have sex with men and individuals with HIV. Other demographics at risk include those demographics that are statistically more likely to participate in unprotected sexual intercourse, African Americans, members of lower socioeconomic classes in urban areas, and sex workers. So let's spend a little bit of time now talking through the pathogenesis of a syphilis infection, correlating it to what's going on in terms of clinical manifestations of disease. Syphilis gains access to the body by penetrating microabrasions in the skin and mucous membranes. Does anyone remember what the first clinical manifestation of syphilis is? That's right, it's a primary lesion called a chancre. But more on that in a moment. Because interestingly, long before a chancre starts forming, you have ongoing systemic spread of the tryponema bacteria. It does this 
by accessing the vasculature and lymphatic system, which gives it access to the entire human body. Now let's go back and talk about that primary local infection. At the site of inoculation, about 21 days after infection, you start to form a chancre. On physical exam, a chancre is a painless, usually singular, raised, red, hardened lesion with a cartilaginous rim around the edges. Now this is kind of gross, but one way to think about it is like a pizza pie. Tomato red with a raised pie crust edge. Mmm. It's very important to keep in mind that a chancre is painless because the differential diagnosis of a painless genital ulcer is short. But, being painless, many individuals don't bother to go to the doctor. Now let's figure out how this chancre gets there and why exactly it's painless. So locally, in the capillary bed, the tryponemas start to leak out from the capillaries into the extracellular space. What we're looking at right here is a capillary with three endothelial cells surrounding it. Once they're in the extravascular space, they cause a nonspecific inflammatory perivascular response with T cells of the CD4 and CD8 lineage, B cells or plasma cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells. They also cause localized lymphadenopathy in the host. The B cells begin to produce antibodies that enhance phagocytosis for macrophages. And these antibodies can also be detected by serological tests that aid in the diagnosis of syphilis. The T cells produce a Th1 cytokine profile that activates these macrophages. But the cytokine milieu also causes capillary endothelium to proliferate and eventually fibrose. And this causes local ischemia. This local ischemia kills nerves as well as soft tissue. This killing of nerves is thought to be why the lesion is painless. The activated macrophages will ultimately create granulomas and clear the infection about four to six weeks after the appearance of the chancre. Now that we've finished our discussion about primary syphilis, let's spend a little bit of time talking about this systemic spread. Secondary syphilis is when patients begin to have clinical manifestations of tryponemal infection a distant to their primary chancre. Now, the pathophysiology of each of these manifestations is basically going to follow the same pattern. There's vascular spread followed by this nonspecific inflammatory response. This inflammatory response leads to vascular proliferation and fibrosis and surrounding tissue ischemia. Syphilis really does behave like a vasculitis, and that means that the clinical manifestations of disseminated disease are quite varied. So about six to eight weeks after the disappearance of the chancre, patients can begin to show signs of secondary or disseminated syphilis. So let's go through this timeline one more time. You're inoculated. 21 days later, you get a chancre. The chancre clears in about four to six weeks. And then six to eight weeks after that, you begin to show signs of secondary syphilis. People experiencing secondary syphilis can have constitutional symptoms from increased systemic cytokines. Constitutional symptoms like fever, fatigue, malaise, etc. However, there's also other, more localizable symptoms. The most common manifestation of secondary syphilis is a maculopapular rash that can occur over the entire body, but predominantly on the trunk and on the palms and soles. The fact that it occurs on the palms and soles is a great diagnostic clue because few things cause a rash in this area. Another common skin finding is a condylomalata, which is a moist, warm, velvety, warty-like rash that's found in the perianal region, vulva, or scrotum. Other complications of secondary syphilis are quite varied, and they include hepatitis, nephropathy, GI involvement, arthritis, optic neuritis, anterior uveitis, alopecia, and meningitis. Like I said, this is because syphilis acts like a vasculitis, and it can damage anything that has its own blood supply. If patients don't undergo treatment, secondary syphilis can actually recur. And patients can experience these symptoms on and off for many years. Eventually, however, end organ damage occurs in a process known as tertiary syphilis. About one third of untreated patients with syphilis will eventually go on to develop tertiary syphilis. There are three types of tertiary syphilis. Can you name the three? The three types are neurosyphilis, cardiac syphilis, and gummatous syphilis. The most common and the most benign is gummatous syphilis, so let's start with that. Gummas are red, indurated areas of necrotic tissue 
Gummas can range from millimeters to several centimeters in diameter. The pathogenesis of gummas is very similar to the pathogenesis of chancres. There's a granulomatous inflammation that results in a large area of necrosis due to this endoarteritis obliterans. Gummas commonly occur on the skin and the skeletal system, but any organ, including internal organs, can be involved. Cardiac syphilis occurs in about 10% of people with late, untreated syphilis, usually about 10 to 40 years after primary infection. Now, if you think back to anatomy, remember that the vasa vasorum of large arteries, like the aorta, was the tiny blood vessel network that provided nutrients to the media and the adventitia layers. In cardiac syphilis, the vasa vasorum undergoes fibrosis, and the muscular media becomes atrophic and weak and prone to aneurysm. This can result in aortic regurgitations and aortitis. Lastly, we have neurosyphilis. Neurosyphilis has three types, meningeal, meningovascular, and parenchomatous. Meningeal syphilis looks a lot like meningitis. There's irritation of the meninges, which results in headaches, nausea, vomiting, and neck stickness. It may be concurrent with or directly following secondary syphilis. Meningovascular syphilis most often presents as an ischemic stroke, usually involving the MCA territory. Parenchomatous syphilis is damage of actual neurotissue. Argyle Robertson pupils Sensorium defects, such as hallucinations and illusions, declines in intellect, personality changes, and hyperactive reflexes are all seen with this type of syphilis. Peripheral neuropathies can result in symptoms like impotence and bladder disturbances. Tabes dorsalis also goes under this category. Tabes dorsalis is loss of the neurons of the posterior columns of the spinal cord, the dorsal roots, and the dorsal root ganglia, all of which leads to a wide, wobbly, ataxic gait and foot drop. During that entire discussion about the pathophysiology and clinical manifestations of syphilis, there were some terms I didn't use, but they're terms you might hear on a test. I'm talking about early latent syphilis and late latent syphilis. For starters, what is plain old latent syphilis? Well, if you have positive serological tests for syphilis with a normal CSF examination and a complete lack of clinical manifestations of syphilis, you have latent syphilis. What about early latent syphilis? That means you have latent syphilis and you know you've had the disease for less than one year. What about late latent syphilis? Late latent syphilis is when you either know you've been infected with syphilis for longer than a year or you don't know how long you've been infected. So why do they make this distinction between early latent syphilis and late latent syphilis? Why not just call both of them latent syphilis? Because the treatments are different. Okay, so we're almost done. Treatment and diagnosis is very straightforward with syphilis, so let's move through this last little bit quickly. For diagnosis, let me say that you can always try to use dark field microscopy by scraping a sample from a primary or secondary syphilis lesion. This is rarely done in practice. Most of the time, you're going to be dealing with serologic tests looking for antibodies. Do you remember the initial screening test for syphilis? That's right, a rapid plasma reagent, or RPR. Now, be aware this test has many things that can cause false positives. I wouldn't try to memorize the list of things that can cause a false positive RPR, but I would know that the positive RPR has to be followed up with a more specific test to make sure you're dealing with syphilis instead of another disease entity. In the CSF, a different serological marker is used for syphilis. Do you remember what it's called? The VDRL, or Venereal Disease Research Laboratory Test. Again, this test can have false positive results. And so these two tests that we've mentioned are used for screening. But what do we use as our confirmatory tests? For a confirmatory test, you're going to use the fluorescent treponemal antibody absorbed test, or FTA-ABS, or the treponemal pallidum particle agglutination test, or TPPA. These tests remain positive for a very long time, maybe even for life, so a patient with previously treated syphilis will still have positive FTA and TPPA serologies, whereas an RPR and VDRL can become negative over time. In terms of treatment, you basically just have to remember two things. First, use penicillin. Second, the longer you have syphilis, or the more serious your syphilis, the more penicillin you're going to use in your treatment. With that in mind, primary, secondary, and latent syphilis all require 2.4 million units of penicillin G intramuscularly.
late latent cardiac or gummata syphilis require 2.4 million units of penicillin G intramuscularly delivered once a week for a total of three weeks. And lastly, for patients with neurosyphilis or patients with a positive VDRL in their CSF that are asymptomatic, are all treated with penicillin G IV 3 to 4 million units every 4 hours for 14 days. If you have a penicillin allergy, you can use doxycycline or tetracycline. This last slide is just going to mention three high yield points that you should be aware of. Syphilis can cross the placenta and infect the fetus. The second high yield point is that if you've been previously infected with syphilis, there is some evidence that you might have some immunity from future infections, but recurrent infections with a different strain of a tryponema organism is very possible and even very likely if you're exposed. Third, you should know patients treated for syphilis with penicillin may experience fever, chills, myalgia, headache, tachycardia, tachypnea, and leukocytosis within the first 12 to 24 hours of their treatment. This is because the tryponema die very quickly when exposed to penicillin, and their lipoproteins are released into the serum, causing a systemic cytokine response. Usually, these symptoms are mild, and they last less than 24 hours. Management is symptomatic. This is known as a gerish herxheimer reaction. That's it. We ran a little long today, but hopefully it was a good review. Check out this link with questions, recommended readings, and a lecture synopsis. Happy studying.